Hi, I'm Craig Tim, and this is ACAMS Live. Uh, thank you, everyone, for who's tuning in live today and for those watching later on replay. Uh, feel free to go ahead and say hello uh, in the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, if you've got questions, you can put those in the comments as well. We'll see if we can get to some of those during the discussion, and then I will stick around after we're done and answer whatever I can. Um, but today we are here to talk about uh, illegal wildlife trade. Illegal wildlife trade is one of the biggest generators of profits for criminal organizations. It devastates local communities and it drives endangered species to extinction. Yet, it, in my view at least, it remains one of the most misunderstood and underappreciated forms of financial crime. So we're gonna work on tackling that today. Uh, my guest is David Fine. He is currently the co-chair of United for Wildlife He's the vice chair of the Earthshot Prize and special counsel at Paul Weiss. Um, but before that, he was group general counsel at Standard Chartered Bank. Before that, he was a prosecutor for many years as the U.S. attorney in the District of Connecticut, an assistant U.S. attorney in uh, the Southern District of New York, and uh, had a stint in between at the White House as associate counsel to President Bill Clinton. So when it comes to financial crime, he has done and seen it all. And over the last several years, he's been spending more and more of his time focused on illegal wildlife trade. So no better person here to have today. David, first, just let me say thank you for being here. Great pleasure, Craig. Delighted to, to join you. And thanks for having this subject in front of your, uh, your big audience. So let's start just setting the scene a little bit and make sure everybody's on the same page as we, as we dive into this discussion. So... Um, maybe you could start just by uh, describing the illegal wildlife trade for us. Um, give us a sense of the scale of the problem. And then maybe what is it that, that drew you to this? Why have you decided to spend so much of, of your time now fighting this really horrific crime? Thank you, Craig. Yeah, as you said, it's, it is a serious crime. It is estimated to be the fourth largest, most profitable trafficking crime in the world behind only narcotics arms and human trafficking, estimated at around $20 billion a year. So it's, it is serious, it's transnational, it's organized crime. Um, when, as general counsel at, at Standard Chartered Bank, um, we developed a program around fighting financial crime and working with other banks, working with governments, working with NGOs, to be more proactive in how we um, could identify and report suspicious activity, going beyond just what was required of us by regulators. And as we did that, and I was part of uh, leading that campaign around fighting financial crime, we were focused on what many of you know, serious financial crime compliance professionals know, the serious money laundering predicates and terrorist financing. And along the way, um, I was approached by United for Wildlife, this amazing initiative, partnership, set up, conceived of, and overseen by Prince William, and asked if we could um, host a meeting to bring banks together to talk about their role in combating IWT, illegal wildlife trade. And I was delighted to do so. And as we, we hosted that meeting, brought a few banks together, and got, I got more and more involved, I learned that what I had always thought of as just a really important conservation crime was also this really serious financial crime. But as you said, one that is kind of overlooked, underappreciated, and not something that was bread and butter, not only for the financial institutions like mine and others that I was working with, but also for government agencies. So for financial investigators in both the public and private sector. And so it struck me that leaving IWT just to conservation agencies and conservationists was completely uh, unfair and wrong because they're up against transnational organized crime. It's not just poachers on the ground. It's not just people from the local community, but it's serious and transnational organized crime with high levels of convergence across other crime types. And so we needed to take it as seriously as we do other transnational organized crime and bring that to bear. So that's what kind of uh, got me very interested in it. And we've, at United for Wildlife now, I created, helped create and lead the financial task force that we created 
with over 50 members now, 50 financial institution members from across the globe. And now I'm co-chair of United for Wildlife, where we have a transport task force, a financial task force, and lots of other members from corporates to governments to NGOs. That's great. And I, and I definitely want to dig in on the United for Wildlife work, because I think that's, you know, public-private partnership and private-private partnership is so important in tackling all these issues. But you mentioned one thing that I think is really interesting there that people may not appreciate, and it's this idea of convergence, right? You, you talked about how it's significant criminal organizations, but these are not criminal organizations solely dedicated to wildlife trafficking. Maybe you can just explain a little bit about what that converge, what convergence means and what other types of activities these groups are involved in. Absolutely. I think it was one of the big epiphanies for me was seeing as we got into cases, both from the financial institution side and then working with law enforcement and governments, um, understanding how significant the levels of convergence are. That's within wildlife trafficking. So it's across species, it's across uh, animals and plants. Um, it has high levels of convergence across to other environmental crimes, illegal logging and mining fisheries. But then we were seeing high levels of convergence with narcotics trafficking. So in one case that um, we supported and from my old office, Southern District of New York, that was prosecuted recently, the Chroma case, the series of defendants, in that one indictment, uh, a number of defendants are charged with trafficking in elephant ivory, rhino horn, heroin, and, mon and committee money laundering. So you see right there the levels of convergence by the organized criminal groups who are essentially commodity agnostic. Um, it doesn't really matter as uh, your as your members know what what the what product or commodity they can traffic in as long as it's profitable, as long as especially where it's high reward and low risk, which for too long I very aptly described IWT. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And, and, you know, as criminal organizations have become these logistic specialists, and as, as you say, commodity agnostic, they're going to go to the lower risk, high reward activity. And if we don't address that, that helps to fund the other activity, whether it's human trafficking, whether it's heroin activity, you know, and, and so I think one of the things that I've seen missing is that, you know, you can't just address one piece, right? If you're not addressing all of the activities of the criminal organizations, they'll shift and adjust and it'll help fund the rest. And I think that's why, you know, fighting illegal wildlife trading in the manner you're doing is so important to the broader mission of fighting financial crime. Couldn't agree more. And a couple of points if I could. So one is that, as you say, um, it's the same networks and it's even the same um, flows financial flows, the same logistics, and so the same kind of transport mechanisms, the same ports, high levels of corruption, so the same corrupt officials participating that are assisting, whether it's trafficking in, in people or narcotics or wildlife. So it's a great, and uh, as we said, high risk, uh, low risk, high reward, um, in some ways, because IWT hasn't had the same sophisticated law enforcement response or financial in institution response, um, what we see is we think it's a, a really good opportunity for countries, for law enforcement to go after transnational organized crime because it might be a bit easier to, to access through a wildlife trafficking case. And then you've gotten to, for some countries, it's not high on the priority list, but you may get to other crimes that are much higher on their priority list. Right, you're getting the same bad guys through a different mechanism, right? And that's exactly. a, a new way of thinking. You, know, you mentioned United for Wildlife, so I wanna dig into that too, because I think it serves a couple of really important functions. One is just raising awareness and all the work that, that the group has done to, to help people understand and what you're doing here today, helping people to understand the significance of this and why it matters. And the second is, is public-private partnership and private-private partnership. So maybe describe in a little more detail for us what some of these task forces do, how you've gone about raising awareness, and, and all of the work that United for Wildlife does. Great. Thank you, Craig. It's, it is a tremendous um, initiative. And, uh, you know, big Prince William and Lord William Hague had this idea 
it'll be a 10th anniversary next year. And it initially brought together some conservation organizations, then brought together transport companies, air, land, and sea, to help educate them as to how their facilities were being used for uh, unwittingly for tra uh, transport of illegal wildlife products and, and animals. Um, and then we formed the financial task force. And it's a small, uh, it, United for Wildlife lives within the Royal Foundation of the, of the Prince and Princess of Wales. And it's a small team. We have a, we're, we're a small but quite busy and active team, uh, but we rely on the work of our partners and our members. And so the, on the financial side, we have over 50 financial institutions, as I mentioned, and they are across um, the Americas, Europe, Africa, Asia, in the Mideast, Australia, New Zealand. And um, to focus on them, especially because of your audience here, what we've tried to do with our financial institution members is first of all, have a commitment from them in order to join, to take IWT um, seriously as a financial crime. We didn't ask anyone, government or private sector, to prioritize this over other crimes, other financial crimes. We asked them to include it with the other financial crimes. And don't, I knew as general counsel of a big bank, we didn't need to create a new program within the banks. We just needed to bring IWT into the existing program. And so we had that commitment from every member that joins. And then to help them, We've created with partners, lots of training materials for their staff, for their financial crime compliance staff, for their tellers, for their um, risk uh, personnel. We've created, um, so, that, so we give uh, information and, and try to make it much easier for them to, to get going on including IWT in their program. And then along the way, we've also um, established regional chapters because we know that we're not gonna, um, we don't know everything here in London where we're headquartered. What's most important is understanding the crime in city, in country, in region. And so we've created a series of regional chapters of United for Wildlife throughout the world, um, including in North America where many ACAMS members are, in Asia, Africa, and all the places I've mentioned. And there we have um, our financial institution members, our transport members, generally the FIU, law enforcement from, from that country, from that region. And we try to help them um, build a really strong local network and then also connect them to other regions as and when they need that connection for following the money um, in these cases. And so it's become you know, a rather robust network. We work with um, corporates as well. So we have corporate partners like Deloitte and Microsoft that have joined us, law enforcement agencies, intergovernmental organizations. So we work very closely with the Financial Action Task Force, the FATF, and have supported their work, their work in this space. We hope your members know because it's very important work in 2020. The FATF did its first uh, study its first report and recommendations about IWT and money laundering. We work with individual countries um, and just try to make uh, it a much more uh, robust uh, identification and response to potential uh, wildlife trafficking. Yeah, that, that fat of piece that you mentioned is really key, right? I think especially as we go into the next round of mutual valuations, you know, this this maybe wouldn't have been something that would have come up in the last round of evaluations. But now that it's something that FATF has mentioned and highlighted, I suspect that as you see countries prepare for those mutual valuations, you'll start to see more work and more attention. And that's important for everybody on this call today to be aware of that this is, you know, it's getting more attention, but that mutual evaluation process can really drive funding, resources, attention, and otherwise that may not have been there before. 100%. And we've had just tremendous support and great leadership from the FATF now across three different presidencies. The 2020 report was under the Chinese president, the Chinese presidency of FATF. We continued to support this work and they supported the work under the German presidency. In fact, in 2021, 
Um, we helped support their work doing the next report, which was on environmental crime more broadly. And we continue under the Singapore presidency. And we just held our global wildlife summit in Singapore with uh, Raja Kumar, the, the president of FATF speaking at our event. He's spoken previously as well in London and um, continuing to show great leadership in that space. And yeah, I do think it's very important for countries in the mutual valuation, but also then the financial institutions in those countries to have read those reports and to, and to follow guidance, the very clear guidance that the FATF has given in, that, in those reports. So how do you, you know, thinking about, you know, the work you're doing with United for Wildlife, what is, what does success look like? How do you, how do you measure that? And what are some of the success stories that have come out of the work? What do you, what do you hope, you know, you've talked about the great network you've built. What, what is the group achieving and what do you hope they will continue to achieve? Maybe one way I, I, I like to think about it is we're, we've tried to really change the paradigm where in the past, wildlife uh, investigations generally ended with the seizure of the wildlife at the border or the arrest of the poacher on the ground. And it struck me from, and I, your, your members will understand this, that's not the case in human trafficking or narcotics trafficking. When there's a seizure um, or an arrest of a poacher or a transporter, um, that's the beginning of the investigation. And so to me, success, in the broadest sense, is the paradigm change that we're seeing in many countries, um, that that's the beginning of the investigation and that there's a follow the money approach on wildlife trafficking as there is on the other transnational organized crime types um, and following that money to get the leadership of the organization because the poacher will be replaced. Um, the poacher is a small player in the organization if they're even in the organization, as we know from the other crime types. And so, and we are seeing more high level, it, it's not just a question of more seizures and, and arrest of poachers. That's not what success looks like to me. It's the uh, a, a arrest and conviction of more senior levels of the organization and the seizure of assets as we do in, in, in other crimes. And we're seeing that there's some really great examples of that and use of public-private partnerships to achieve that. And so there are some countries that have really taken to heart the FATF guidance and are living that. And we're supporting their work and trying to bring more countries into that uh, approach. There's a, a good question that just came from online that we should have probably hit on. I should have asked about before because I think it's another one of those misconceptions. So thank you, Gabrielle, for asking this question. Um, I think, you know, so so I'm in the U.S. You know, you're currently sitting in London. I think one of the misperceptions, another one, is that this is an over there problem, right? This is an Africa issue. This is, you know, I don't think people understand the global reach of these networks and where, how supply and demand works and how that all fits in. So maybe you can just explain a little bit for us the global dimensions. The specific question was which country should be more concern, most concerned about it. And so if you wanna answer that, that's okay. But I think there's a lot of the world should be concerned about this. This isn't just a, a them problem, depending on where you are. Completely. And I think that uh, I'll go back to the FATF report, which their first recommendation to countries is to do a risk assessment. And that'll be very familiar to your members, is understand the nature, the exposure in your country to this crime. What is that exposure? And there are many countries in the world are source countries. And so they, are, they have the protected species. Um, and that's across the globe. We, we think of wildlife trafficking, we often think of elephants and rhinos and lions. And so you immediately think about Africa, but there are, there's an amazingly large and distressing pet bird trade. So mm -hmm. anywhere uh, with, with exotic birds, reptiles, uh, such as eels, fish uh, uh, that, are, that are endangered. Um, so for, first there is the, the, the source nature of it. Then there's destination. And it's a remarkable list of countries that are destination countries for the trafficked species. And while we might tend to think of that as largely in Asia, driven by some demand out of, out, out of Asian countries, there's demand in the US, there's demand in the Mideast, there's demand across the globe. But understand what that demand is. 
um, which is the FATF guidance, there are hotspots for transit. And so on some very important flows from say Africa to Asia, there are important transit countries, transshipment countries, and that includes the UAE and Singapore, for example. And so understanding that, and then there's the fact that this is a $20 billion a year trafficking enterprise. So you can imagine that financial centers are implicated, big financial centers across the globe, especially including uh, in the US where US dollars are often the, the mechanism for the trade. And so understanding that uh, both as a country under the FATF guidance, but as a financial institution, understanding where your bank has exposure to IWT is really the first step that we recommend for everyone. And in that regard, one of the other tools we created was a template for financial institutions to do an IWT risk assessment, um, which we thought was a, a really important, you know, first understand the nature of the, of the problem and then react to it. So I, I think you're right. It is a mistake to think of this as, you know, a problem that is focused on South Africa or Kenya because of the large population of elephants and rhinos there. It's a global issue and it affects countries in different ways, but it affects almost every country in the world. And I would imagine it affects, there's exposure across every one of your members. Yeah, you, so we got another question coming in from the audience around what AML professionals can do. I think you, you hit on a first one there with the risk assessment. Is that template public? Or Good how question. would they access it's, it? Is there an ability for them to reach out to United for Wildlife if they want to do that? Or, or if not, that's okay. We've got other resources we can point them to, but you just sure. mentioned it, so I thought I'd ask. It, yeah, I imagine it might be limited to our members, but our membership is open to financial institutions who, as I said, make a commitment to include IWT in their financial crime compliance program. So it's a pretty, we, we have a, we operate on a big tent and we want, you know, more, most, uh, banks to, to be part of this. So uh, go to unitedforwildlife.org. There's a contact us at the bottom and um, please hopefully join us, but I'll, you can also ask for a, a copy of the template. Um, we work with professionals, some of our members, as well as professional organizations to help develop that. Um, that so that is a really important first step. I think it's really important. You've mentioned public private partnerships. I think really important to be uh, for your members to use those in the in executing on this and every other financial crime. We found that the most, and I'm not surprised by this, the most success we've seen in countries have been in those countries that have robust PPPs. And so, you know, some of the highlights that we we've seen have been in the U.S., where we have this great statutory provision called 314B from the USA Patriot Act that allows for sharing of information. Um, another great success story is in South Africa where they have uh, three or four years old now a public-private partnership called SAMLET, which right at the outset created a, an illegal wildlife trafficking um, task force that United for Wildlife helps support and is a member of. And Australia, um, with their Fintel Alliance public-private partnership, um, has also done leading work. And in each of those three instances, US, South Africa, and Australia, that work included a risk assessment, as FATF recommended, a public risk assessment by the FIU with contributions from financial institutions. So first, taking measure of the crime in their country. So using the FATF guidance, which was a global guidance, and then going deeper in their country. And so FinCEN did that in the US, Samlet did it in South Africa, and, um, and the Alliance did it in, in Australia. So, you know, and the other thing that strikes me that may be necessary for, for folks within their institutions is maybe to create their own awareness. You know, if you've got a lunch and learn or a training or just a team meeting, you know, United for Wildlife has great resources out there. There's the FATF work you know, that education, you know, if you just go internally and say, hey, we need to join United for Wildlife, you may find that people don't yet understand the why. And I think you can build your own training internally and awareness internally that then will will explain the why. 
And then the other thing I'd say is, you know, you mentioned the bar for entry is just to consider United for Wildlife. I think, you know, we work together, ACAMS and United for Wildlife and others, along with the World Wildlife Fund, the Basel Institute for Governance on a free certification course um, on illegal wildlife trade. So anybody out there, you don't have to be an ACAMS member. You can go to the ACAMS website. We'll put a link in there that will give you what the financials look like for different types of institutions. And, and, and so you can use that as a tool to start to, you know, create your risk assessment to understand where your risks might be. And so, you know, all the resources are out there for folks to get involved, you know, and we'll link to all of them right here. So it, it really is not a high bar if you want to join this fight. Yeah, no, and thank you for, I mean, ACAMS has been a great, a great partner and we've loved that partnership. We've done a number of events together, highlighting different aspects and also in different regions. And I think that's really important to give a regional lens to this, to this problem because it's very different as well as the question about money laundering predicates and the, what, the, what, what, what the domestic situation is. So one of the really important things we're working on now, and again, why it's so important to be up on this as a financial crime compliance professional is because I think it is getting much more attention at the national level. Um, at our Global Wildlife Summit in Singapore, just uh, that I mentioned just uh, a few weeks ago, we announced Prince William and his keynote remarks. He, he was there in person on a state visit and he, he gave the keynote remarks and he announced a statement of principles that we had facilitated um, for countries to kind of live out the guidance from the FATF report and say international collaboration is really important to this, not just the domestic understanding and knowledge and follow the money, but because it's such a serious cross-border crime, we need to follow the money when it leaves the country. We need to follow the traffic goods and the traffickers when they leave our country. And so it's a statement of principles of cooperation uh, across border, uh, of using money laundering laws where appropriate, the importance of doing that in the follow the money, sharing intelligence, and uh, using public-private partnerships. So endorsing all of that and we were very pleased to announce seven countries signing on to that statement of principles. Um, Australia, Canada, which has taken a really great leading role in this space as well. Um, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, uh, South Africa, Singapore, United States, and United Kingdom. So uh, seven countries and more will be now joining. We, we announced it, we published that statement of principles. And we had support as well in our press release from the president of FATF and from the acting director of the Egmont Group. So it just shows you the growing understanding of this as a financial crime and the importance of you know, every financial institution making sure it includes it in its financial crime compliance program as appropriate. So, so we're getting towards the end of our time here. That, that's fantastic because just like institution, you know, a lot of folks here are probably in financial institutions, just like we have silos, governments have silos and breaking down those silos domestically and internationally is such a critical step. And I think that, that the work that you're doing and I'm certain the mutual evaluation will drive more of that. And United for Wildlife plays such a critical role as a cross border agency and being able to facilitate that and get countries up to speed on knowledge and otherwise so that then they can take it off and, and magnify the impact. We had a question here that, that was an interesting one and, 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 um, and this, we'll end on this before we wrap up because I know we're reaching the bottom of the hour, but it, it was about, you know, it talks about, you know, working with children and others. And, and how do you think about sharing this message? You know, what could, you've talked about what we can do in FIs, but what can we do just as people to, with our friends, our family, what are other ways that we can share what we're learning, help them understand this problem? Because, you know, there's only so much financial institutions can do, you know, the more this is a whole of society concern, the better we're going to be able to tackle it. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on that. We do, we do. Uh, and it's a great question and it's really important. Um, we think storytelling and narrative is really important. And that's one of our kind of next priorities is to make sure that we're getting the message out as best we can or helping others get the message out. Because as I said, we're a small organization and we rely on partners. But I think the understanding of um, the importance of understanding what's happening out there to these iconic species that we take for granted, um, that we assume will always be with us 
their numbers are severely um, in jeopardy. Absolutely. I mean, just it, it's stunning. There are more tigers in captivity um, in the United States than there are tigers in the wild in the world. Um, and so just think about that for a moment, how threatened that population is. Um, and, what, and, and that we could do that across a number of, of, of major species. Can you imagine a world without tigers, without elephants, without rhinos? Um, and so getting that message out, understanding the threat, understanding the importance of it. Um, we do a lot on the role of, uh, we've been focusing a lot on the role of rangers, wildlife rangers who are really the first level of the first line of defense um, for wildlife, for nature, for biodiversity. Um, and so, uh, yes, we agree completely and, and we'd love, you know, our partners support in sharing that not only in your institutions so that people feel motivated, but across across society as well. Yeah, and that storytelling is something that 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 travels any like it can start at the dinner table, right? With your kids and 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 you can you can yeah, different stories and and you know the just the tigers might go away, might have a real impact on kids. And you know, that's a message. Or, you know, for adults, you some of the images of what happens to these animals and and other things, you know, there are ways to tell stories that you know people will care about, even those that aren't, you know, living the financial crime aspect of it, like like we are. Uh, David, I think we could talk to you for, for hours on this. Um, we'll have to have you back at ACAMS events in the future because I think there's there's so much more we could get into. But I really want to thank you for being here today. It, you know, we've talked a lot about it. Financial crime fighting is a community effort, but there's a lot that, that individuals can do themselves. And, and David, I think you've been a great example of this, uh, you know, for many out there, I know for me personally, you know, not just in the illegal wildlife trade, but in building public private partnerships, one person and their drive and effort can make a tremendous difference. Uh, and I've seen you do that and I've seen others do that. And so, you know, for those of you out there, like you, you can make a difference, like individual people are changing the world. So David, I thank you for being here today and for all that you've done over the years. Thank you, Craig, and thanks for having me, and thanks for your storytelling, which I think is really effective in bringing to life the fight against financial crime more broadly. Well, to all of you out there, thank you again for tuning in. I really appreciate it. We tried to, I don't know if we got to all the questions, so if there's more in there, I will stay in there and answer them. Really appreciate you being here, and we will look forward to seeing you again next time on ACAMS Live. Thank you, everybody.